It's the KQ Morning Show, 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It is Wednesday, November the 8th. Good morning. And I'll just come right in and tell you I made a huge mistake. Oh, what happened? Okay, so well, maybe you remember yesterday. I mean, it was just yesterday. I said, oh, guys, hey, guys, gal, I'm flying to Nashville because I'm going to go see a playoff soccer game because Nashville SC, a team I've been a longtime season ticket holder to, has a big playoff game, and I'm going to go with my brother, and we're lifelong soccer jerks together, and we're really <laughs> excited. It's a moment we've waited our lives for. Literally wa- came to Tennessee, where I still sit today, and I watched my team just, well, I can't say what they did. They wet the bed from start to finish. <laughs> one of the worst, oh. one of the worst sporting events of my life. At oh, halftime, no. I just wanted to get in the car and start the 900-mile drive home just to <laughs> punish myself. That sucks. <laughs> wow. I mean, I, I'm, and I started thinking about it. Like, okay, I was looking forward to this game from the minute I realized we were going to be in the playoffs. My brother and I have been waiting to see a game of this magnitude together at home in Nashville for decades. Absolute piss poor performance, devastating. Uh, was it worth the trip? No, no, it was terrible. <laughs> I regret everything about it. And yeah. I just and now, so now I'm like, okay. That's one for the books. This might be the sporting event experience of my life that I regret the most. Like as far as, <laughs> you know, the, the build up, and, and I'm thinking about it. Like just a, even an ugly win would have been worth it. Like it wasn't like they would have needed to win five any five nil to to make up for how much I was excited about it. But between this, uh, I'd say between this. And, um, but, well, what's the worst concert I ever saw? Same thing. I know I've walked out of gigs going, I can't believe I waited for that. No, uh, right. But, man, I, I, and I don't mean just simply because your team loses. But, you know, I could take a loss if, if my team had played well. I could take a loss if it had been an exciting, we were almost in it. No, this was, the, this was one of those where five minutes in, we're like, oh, no, this is going to be the longest <laughs> game of our lives. Uh-huh. <laughs> Well, we, I mean, everybody knows the feeling. I'm assuming. You know, you're talking to Minnesota fans here. I mean, it's uh, uh, <laughs> you know a first round playoff losses from the Wild last season uh, to the Vikings. To I mean, it just goes on and on. Heartbreaking losses. I remember, you know, uh, losing to the Giants 41 to nothing or something like that in an NFC Championship game or yeah. Gary Anderson's missed field goal. Welcome to sure, Heartbreak sure. Hotel, man. Yeah, yeah. I think you're. Uh, you're going to fit in nicely around here come playoff time. Well, I, it, well okay, and here's another uh, Minneapolis specifically, Minnesota angle. I saw the replacements in 85 and I was waiting weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> now that was a that was a that was a complete crap in the bed on another level because they came out, they were too, you know, Tom, uh, Bob was too drunk to play. Yeah. Uh, so so he left after one song. The rest of the band valiantly tried three more without him. And then Paul basically passed out. But but it fit. That made sense. That was like, this is the greatest gig I've ever seen. They're as drunk and stupid as I hope they'd be. But <laughs> you don't expect that from a soccer team. You don't expect that, you know. Yeah, Gary Anderson missed the field goal, but they were in the game. Um, you know, oh, man, this is just one of those. Uh, it's it's just going to take a while. The sting is going to it's the sting is gonna linger. That's what I'm trying to say here, guys. How was the food at the stadium? The food at the stadium was not bad. Okay, well, it was, that, that, thank you, thank you for that silver lining. Uh, not as good as the food I would have had sitting at home last night watching this crap. <laughs> if I right. if I'd stayed in Minneapolis, if I was at home, if I was at home right around the the corner from the friendly confines of KQRS last night, I would have t- turned it off twenty minutes in. I literally would not have continued to watch. That's how bad they played. Yeah, really, I mean, I had a great night last night. <laughs> Oh, great. And that's because you didn't go to Nashville to a terrible soccer game. What'd you do, Candace? I tried to convince you to stay, but you went. You, you know what? You really did. And I thank you for that. You're welcome. What'd you do? What, so what did happen? What was what was going on? I mean, you, you set it up. I mean, in. I'm waiting. Did you win the lottery? What the hell's going on over there with no, you? I just went out for a nice Italian meal, but something interesting happened. Um, I got a little sick. In the middle of the night. <laughs> that is. I'm intrigued. Okay, so this has never happened before. I've gotten, you know, like diarrhea before. 
I got it. Okay. And then <laughs> another diarrhea story. I, suddenly, no I'd rather be in Nashville at a lousy <laughs> soccer game. I'm just trying to lighten you guys up. You guys are all tense this morning. Anyway, so this is what happened. I have like little red like patches on my body. What's up with that? Ooh. Am I allergic Little to red something? patches? Little what? itchy red areas. Like, I don't know if I'm, I'm allergic. Yeah, I'm not a doctor, but a quick Google here. Are you gonorrhea? <laughs> Are they all over the place? <laughs> not... No, they're just like, it's, I'm just itchy. I don't know. I think I'm allergic to something in like the sauce, maybe. I don't know. Oh, that, that, your... that sounds like a food, a food mm. and or drink allergy that mm-hmm. you encountered last mm-hmm. night. Although... Although not that long ago, someone I know changed their laundry detergent and just jumped in there that. in the sheets and, yeah, woke oh. up with red patches all over themselves. Very itchy. Uh, she mm-hmm. uh, found out that she's hyperallergenic or whatever to uh, uh, this particular type of laundry detergent. I don't know. We're just spitballing here this morning. Wow. Candace, but I think you may have gotten Steve's mind off that awful Good. soccer game just Thanks. for a moment. I know. You, I, don't, I don't know what I was thinking, but I'm all I'm thinking about now is... Uh, your wonderful night. Uh, you know what might cheer you up? How about a Hollywood report, Steve? I know it's not Aloha Friday. He's not going to sing for us this morning. Uh, but we have Mike Evans' Hollywood report at 6.30. Hang tight. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show for Wednesday, November the 8th. It is a very, very special time of day. It is Mike Evans' Hollywood report time of day. Good morning, Mike. Hey, good morning, Steve. Good morning. Good morning, Minnesota. This report brought to you by Marcus Theaters. Got some exciting news to talk about movies coming out this weekend. We'll get to that and place to see it. It's, of course, Marcus. Hey, I I couldn't wait to talk to you about this because I know you'll be interested. Uh, There's a documentary that dropped uh, yesterday, very, very limited release. It'll go into a wider release on the 17th, then uh, slip, slip into streaming shortly after. If you like rock and roll, if you like the Rolling Stones, this is a must, must see movie. It is the documentary The Stones and Brian Jones. Um, as you know, Brian Jones reportedly founded the Rolling Stones originally. Uh, he did. But shortly after that, shortly after a little success, there was a riff in the band. Uh, and shortly after that, Brian accidentally drowned. Uh, it was shocking mm-hmm. back then. It's still shocking now. Um, it's it's in shock waves then and now. Brian, I, a lot of people say Brian could have been the best, most talented person in the band. Some will disagree. Great interviews from all the Stones, including Charlie Watts from uh, Archives, uh, Marianne Faithful, Eric Burden, all kinds of people talking about uh, about this part of the Rolling Stones. Write it down. It's great. The Stones and Brian Jones. What say you, Steve? Um, Brian Jones is like James Harden. You know, he can score at will, but when it comes to the playoffs, he disappears, he shrinks, he sucks. But anyway, that's just one man's opinion. (laughs) (laughs) Someone was at a soccer game last night. I'm sorry, Brian. Brian, Hey, Brian, he's no Keith or Mick. I mean, uh, mean, God bless him. And and he was a tortured soul, and I think he's struggled with addiction. But, I mean, at the end of the day, they made their best music ever in my opinion, after he left the band, and he was a drag, and and it's just a, it's just what it is. He's he a pop wasn't star. He wasn't a, he, ago, really. No, he was no, he wasn't, and he did name the band. He was. Yeah. Plus, Oops. Making you're, you're for breaking the, up. You're breaking up on me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, it, you see the whole thing, mm-hmm. and. He's not that he's so checked out. He's not even a part of it. Anyway, I mean, you know, love to his family, of course. I think it's a, I, I still think it's great history of the Rolling Stones and worth seeing. Uh, oh, oh, I will, I will watch Mike. Hey, Mike, sorry, sorry. I will absolutely watch it. And I, and I, but I mean, in the grand scheme, I guess I'm a little, I guess it's a button issue with me because there are still people out there that say the stones are never the same without Brian Jones. And it just gets a little, okay, relax. All right. You know, like I said, postseason game seven, it's the, not the guy you want on the court. No, I agree. Uh, the Stones probably may have become a lot more successful without Brian Jones. He was in the make or break part of the, of the band. But the story of how he, how they started and the conflict, I mean, Bill Wyman and Brian almost killed each other. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Great. Can't wait. Family Feud news. Nothing like a little Family Feud news. Uh, 
So for years, this father and daughter, they just didn't speak. And then she had children, and they made up, and they started talking again. Well, that's over. Uh, John Voight and his daughter Angelina Jolie are not speaking again, and this time they're taking shots at each other, uh, and it's all because of their difference of opinions in the Israel-Hamas war. Uh, John calls Angelina Mm -hmm. a liar. Uh, She won't even talk about him except to say mean things. And there's going to be more family feud because Angelina can't be happy to hear about that ex-Brad Pitt and Enos de Ramon are so serious. The word is they're, they're going to be moving in together, which is going to piss off Angelina Jolie again. A little family feud sure. in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, TV news. Is anybody surprised? The NFL ratings just keep going up and up and up. You know, there's some talk that some of the networks that carry the NFL games, it's the increase that they are charging for commercials for the games that are keeping some of these networks profitable. I'm not surprised. I don't doubt that that at all. Yeah, not surprised. No, it makes it totally totally checks out. Um, I think I think with. you know, without the monoculture and with so many options and people watching uh, so many different things, the only thing left that 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 you can really experience as is live sporting events. You know what I mean? Like everybody else watches shows at their own time, so you can't discuss it all together on Monday morning. Uh, boy, football fills that void. Everyone's watching the same games at the same time, and there's not many of those opportunities left. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's become a Saturday Night Live thing, and it's a good thing. Uh, the producers find a big movie that's coming out, and then they go out and they get the star of that movie and get them to host Saturday Night Live just a couple of weeks before that movie is released. Uh, so Jason Momoa will be hosting November 18th Saturday Night Live just prior to his Aquaman 2 being released. It's really a smart move. I mean, uh, it's good for the movie. It's good for the celebrity. It's good for Saturday Night Live. Works of course. Um, I don't know. Does anybody care about Barbara Streisand's 700-page book? <laughs> Brian? Uh, <laughs> I will, you know. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'll wait for it, the audio version uh, when I've got a weekend to set aside, man. I mean, in, in the book... 600 pages... 600 pages, Mike, I could have done, but seven, that's pushing it, Babs. (laughs) She makes a big, big deal in part of the book about how Marlon Brando was so persistent and very rude about wanting to have sex with her, but she didn't give it. I'm going, who the hell cares? And today's goofy sign posted on a door, and you've been there a hundred times, inside the famed Hollywood Comedy Store on Sunset. Uh, okay. The sign on uh, the, the inside the door of, a, of the club read, anyone caught exiting through this door will be asked to leave. What? But, I, see, mm. I see what they're funny. Were, were trying they trying to be to funny because it's the comedy store? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, one of the oh, because you're already leaving. We're gonna ask you to leave. Okay, I get it. I, I get, get it. it. Oh yeah. my god, that's incredible. It's nutty. Okay. Uh, hey, have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you. <laughs> right on, Mike Evans. Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> that Mike was puzzled. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was. I think. Yeah. I think it took Mike. Uh, thank you, brother. We appreciate it. Yeah, I thought about you just like unemployed <laughs> comics up, that work at the comedy club. <laughs> oh, is he doing that? People do that, right? They won't hang God. up right away. My I'm a commenter. Yeah. Just hang up the fool. Well, Man. I got Christmas shopping, Hanukkah <laughs> shopping done for all you guys. The Babs yeah. book. Thank you. I got, you. I got all mine done, too. I hey. hope you guys like Halloween costumes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, as much as I love a good audio book, what I would really rather have is Barbara Streisand's book read by you, Tony. Oh, Ooh, I don't yes. know who reads it yes, officially. Yes, but... let's do that. You can All read right. it to us. Um, you can come over to our houses and read it to us. And I'll do funny it. voices and accents. It'll yeah. make it so much more pleasurable. That's awesome. Well, you know, that's a great <laughs> idea, Candace. But how about this? How about we just do an excerpt a day on the morning show? Oh, oh even better. <laughs> That's kind of funny. You know, take actually. like five minutes of Barbara's life from Tony. It'll get us into 2026 by okay. the time it's finished. It'll be great. Done.
Yes, yeah. like I said it All takes right, well, over forty eight hours to read. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's 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 something wonderful we can all look forward to. But before we can do that, we do have to look back. How about a history lesson? Steve's getting it done. I am getting it done. And on this day in 1970, when I say this name, everybody that remembers will go, "Oh yeah." On this day in 1970, Tom Dempsey got it done when he kicked a 63-yard field goal. He was a member of the New Orleans Saints. He kicked that ball against the Detroit Lions, 63-yard field goal. Uh, and that record held until 1998 when Jason Elam of the Broncos tied the record. And then a few years ago, Justin Tucker of the Ravens went past it and now holds the record with 66 yards. But the reason Tom Dempsey's field goal in 1970 was such a big deal was, well, guys, we all know he had half a foot. Mm -hmm. yeah, and as a foot. kid... Yeah, as a five-year-old kid, that that's all anyone cared about. Did you see the guy who's missing part of his foot kick that field goal? And, I mean, the legend was born. He was like a superhero uh, for all of the half-footers out there, I guess. Yeah, Rodney King, our high school kicker at the time, wanted to cut off half his foot. R wanted to well, cut off his toes, yeah. You, yeah. you figured it must be a, an advantage or something, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's, I think, uh, I think that was it. It's, it's kind of like when that South African guy was running on those blades and people were like, maybe I'm going to get rid of these legs and run on blades. But mm. thankfully, I don't think anyone ever did that. I'm still hopeful. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> think about just attachments you could put on. Skis, you know, don't have to, those boots that hurt so much anymore. You just, it would be like a G.I. Joe doll, man. Just put on your attachments. We can we can get a sponsor wrapped around that zap, and we can have a lot of fun. So I appreciate yeah. your willingness. It's the KQ Morning Show, ninety two KQRS. Zip, Tony, Candace, and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show, ninety two KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It is Wednesday, November the eighth. Good morning. I mentioned earlier in the show. I'm just filled with regret today. Just over. <laughs> My cuppeth overrunneth with regretteth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get that tattooed on my back. My cuppeth overrunneth with regretteth. I flew to Nashville yesterday uh, where I sit right now just just wondering what's wrong with me. I came down for a soccer game. I, I know why I did it. I'm a big fan of the team. I have season tickets. My brother and I went to the game together. We were looking forward to this. And, and Nashville came out and they just crapped the bed. It was an awful performance and an, an inglorious end to a difficult season. And I'd be much happier to be right back at the friendly conference finds a KQ as opposed to, uh, you know, being in Nashville, Tennessee, which it's nice to get back, but I wish yeah. I hadn't even come. Filled with regret. Mm. However, I can get on a plane. I can fly back to Minneapolis today. No one on that plane, if I don't tell them, is going to know what I've endured. No one's going to go, rough game last night, huh? I'm just going to get on the plane and mind my own business, and I'll be back uh, in the Twin Cities mid-afternoon, and it'll be great. Yeah, it's going to be great. You know, we can't wait. I know. And you know why no one's going to know? Because I didn't, because I didn't last night or yesterday get a tattoo, like say, I don't know, maybe on my forehead that said Nashville's going to win. I guarantee it. <laughs> that, I didn't do that. See, because I'm no? not a complete fool. I did not do that. Now I tattooed it on my heart, but no one has to know. And I mention that because if you're wondering why Steve might actually think of tattooing Nashville's going to win on his forehead. Well, I wasn't thinking about that. But a woman on TikTok has apparently tattooed her boyfriend's name, which is Kevin, K-E-V-I-N, in fairly large letters right across her forehead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's prominent. That's wow. not even bangs are going to cover that up. If I was Kevin, I would no. break up with her just for that, you know, just to have a good laugh. It's, it's, now what are you going to do? Well, you know, it, it's like that whole thing in Arrested Development. It, you you got to teach a lesson to somebody sometimes. <laughs> um, it, the, and there are, there are videos of this being done. There are photos all over TikTok. A woman has said, uh, a, a woman, uh, let's see, her name is Anna... Stanskovsky, and she's got uh, almost 600,000 followers on TikTok, and she apparently, and she is a, a, a already very, uh, a lot of tattoos, shoulders, throat, yeah. uh, back, She's she is inked up, this is not like a one-off, and she finally made the commitment to Kevin to uh, get that <laughs> tattoo right across her forehead, Kevin, and... Um, and she's got millions of views on these, uh, 20 million views this week yeah. alone. Yeah. 
I don't know. Boy, how I feel and, and of I'm, course, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't know how I feel if I'm Kevin. You know, you want uh, someone to really be into you, but you don't want them to be that into you that they do something that's, you know, life altering. By the way, uh, there are a lot of people online that are saying, ah, this is a fake. It should be this. It should be that. Uh, she's uh, responding to the people that say it's a fake tattoo. Oh, my God. I love it. I don't think it's a, such a big deal. Like, for someone, I've got so many tattoos. Like, I don't think it's a, such a big deal. Mm, she didn't think it's such a big deal. I mean, the penmanship is nice. Look at that K. I mean, it should, it's perfect. Well, you it's, know, it's almost its almost like calligraphy. It's so wonderfully I done. Li- I like it. Kevin yeah. could have reciprocated and gotten uh, Stan Skofsky on his forehead. <laughs> yeah, right. Wow, Maybe that's, that's a very good point. And, yeah, arch it around to the other side. I had a buddy in basic training. We all went down and got our tattoos. I got an eagle. You know, that was back when you could go get a tattoo just drunk as a skunk. And then it had about five tattoos you could choose from. Uh, but he got Lisa. Because you've been in basic training. It was your first time away from home. Everybody falls in love with the last person they just kissed, you know. You go up to basic training. Uh, two weeks later, it's like, I want to marry her. She's the greatest woman in the world. So he gets Lisa. We tried to talk him out of it. Uh, he wouldn't hear it. Even the tattoo artist tried to talk him out of it. I run into him a year later. And I say, hey, man, how's uh, Lisa? And he said, well, I think she's doing okay. I married a Tammy. And just before it came out of my mouth, I pointed, and he lifted up his shirt, and there was a beautiful black panther where it used to say Lisa. <laughs> I don't know how she's going to cover up Kev when, not if, when this relationship tanks. It might be 10 years from now or whatever, but yeah, it, it's huge on there. And uh, yeah, tattoo regrets, that's that's one of those. Because even if you get it removed, it's terribly painful and leaves a scar. I, I think she could. I'm looking at these photos now. She could add an L, if need be, and go Kelvin, and then yeah. turn this into a temperature, uh, <laughs> a, a unit of measurement for yeah. temperature. No, no, I've always been a fan of the Kelvin scale, sure. and I'm and I'm, I'm obsessed with a concept of absolute zero. So, you know, maybe that would work. Um, but, oh, yeah, by the way, I mean, I'm, we should probably post this if no one's, if people can't see it. But these are not small letters. I mean, this is this is from the hairline almost to the eyebrow, that Kev. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's covering the forehead entirely. But I guess at some point, w- once your throat is tattooed, to yeah. me, it, it pretty much says, well, just do this. It doesn't matter what's on the face. When I see throat tattoos, that's almost always when I recognize, okay, this person is on a different level. Uh-huh. Um and I think it's just because I look. I don't have a single tattoo, I, and I imagine them. I know they're not like so much. I, I understand the pain level. I mean, I've had it explained to me enough times. But just the idea of it being on my throat, whether it hurts or not, that just really, I, I I'm I'm very vulnerable where my throat's concerned. I, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, if if anybody's hand happens to get anywhere near my Adam's apple, I have a thing. It's a button with me oh. and i can't imagine having a tattoo artist just working around my adam's apple going up and down my throat so once you've crossed that mm-hmm. threshold i mean the forehead is just yeah. uh, to me it's open for advertising dollars i put coca-cola on there for god's <laughs> sakes get some money out of this not yeah, a lot of room I mean, for error on the throat either no, yeah, no, really, no, no. It's not like his name is Ambrose. I mean, there's a lot of Kevin's out there. If this one doesn't work <laughs> out, then you know, just find yourself a new Kevin. They're all over the place. Everyone's chiming in on the KQ Facebook page, and Sarah said something funny. She said, "If you're not, if you don't have a tram stamp, and you're in your 40s, I don't know what you were doing back in the day." <laughs> right, you weren't making bad decisions. You weren't getting plowed for crying out loud. Um, yeah, we, my we mom did, uh, has one for God's sake. Are you serious? Yeah, she got oh hers in her God. 50s. It was, uh, I don't know, fashionable. Therefore, I, I said, Mom, we're already making fun of that. It has a name. And I wrote a tramp stamp, and she said, Brian, how dare you say that? I'm like, what are you doing? She had a midlife crisis <laughs> down, down when her and dad were going to nudist beaches down in St. Thomas. She got a tramp stamp. I love stamp. that. She should send yeah. a picture in. Tell her to post on the KQ Facebook page. I, I, she has no <laughs> idea I work here. She never will. I don't. I don't know if that's a midlife crisis as much as it's a like a rebirth uh, celebration is what I would yeah. call that. Yeah, Dad's crazy about it. Butterfly, I understand. 
Brandy <laughs> said that she was 14. She wanted a heart, so she went to go get the heart on her chest. But halfway through, she decided she was stupid. So here she sits with half a heart. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh man. That tattoo for her. Well, I have a very good friend that got a tiger in Chinese writing. That was the other fad, right? Remember the Chinese letters? Sure. Mm-hmm. sure. And till she ran into someone who spoke Chinese, oh, my no. my friend's uh, girlfriend, and she said, why do you have 13 tattooed on you? Ah! We're like, no, 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 don't. Uh, but yeah, yeah, 13, yeah, the tattoo artist in South Mini, or South St. Paul. He doesn't know how to speak freaking Chinese. He's just like, yeah, we, this is What do you think it said? Tiger. Okay. Her last Tiger. Name. We had a, a the couple oh. guys on the on the Black Crows crew in the nineties, a, a little ahead of the tattoo cra- like early nineties. I mean, if you remember, like when Guns N' Roses hit in eighty seven and, and they had some tattoos, that was like kind of like, wait, what? Those guys are actually they're not in the navy. What are they doing with tattoos? Yeah. Um there <laughs> that was the beginning, really, by the mid mid eighties was the first time you'd see just like rockers embracing the tattoo thing that, that I was aware of. I I didn't really notice any in the seventies, early eighties, but by the mid eighties it was happening. By the late eighties, absolutely happening, and then the nineties it just went kind of crazy. Um a couple guys on our crew uh, one monitor guy did the thing where he was getting the the wrap around the bicep tattoo, and the tattoo artist literally didn't connect it. When he came around the other side, he oh, was no. his lines were off. <laughs> oh no! And 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 on the inside of his bicep, he had to just add a hole. You know, it was like it just, it's like there's that it looked like barbed wire going across the arm, and it comes up underneath, and then all of a sudden there's just like a. A, a Rorschach test or whatever you call that yeah. thing, just like an ink blot that may be any number of things to connect the two lines of uh, barbed wire. And then the other one, and, and I never got confirmation on this, and it sounds like an old joke, but uh, w- uh, we had a, a Euro- on the European tour, one of the English guys who was on the tour, he had a bunch of Chinese lettered tattoos on both arms, and he swore on his life that one of them, which he thought said something like, you know, he had a mantra, and, you know, like I always like to say, life rewards action. You know, that's a, it's a real thing in my life. Uh, and he had one of those, which I don't remember what his wording was, but he swears that he was told that what he actually had on his arm was beef and broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, is that good are- for you? Very few tattoo artists, and a lot of these were getting them before the internet. They didn't know how to speak Chinese. It never occurred to someone that uh, Chuck, of given the tattoo, doesn't know how to speak Chinese and probably doesn't have a Chinese dictionary around. Uh, the people or, getting them didn't know. Or Chuck giving the tattoo is just hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> Uh, Sooner or later, you're going to run into someone who speaks Chinese or just getting a bad tattoo. My brother has a, a lion that's supposed to be growling on his arm, just the face of the lion growling. Uh-huh. But the, for some reason, they closed one eye, so it looks like a, a oh. sexy wink, you know, or like, why is there... <laughs> so why is the lion, he's not lying, he's, uh, he's, he's not winking, he's growling. It looks like he's giving just a really pervy wink. And I had another friend that got, she got a t- uh, one a flower, a nice flower. It looks like a head of cabbage. We're like, why do you have cabbage? It's not cabbage, <laughs> it's a flower. It's supposed to be a lotus. We're like, it's not a lotus, it's definitely cabbage. Well, I, my I've, buddy, I've been thinking we, about this, I'm... I'm looking for my first tattoo, and I've I've got a little sketch here. If you could possibly put this on my back, it's a it's a Bengal tiger suppressing a sneeze. Can you do that for me? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, Tony. What were you saying? Oh no, uh, a buddy of mine who you met the other night, Mike Doucette, in gigantic block letters on his arm, just has his name Mike. Because like, well, yeah. you yeah. perhaps will forget. Um, hey, I, the, I toured with a Welsh band called Stereophonics, and their bassist, Richard Jones, a wonderful man, he has his name tattooed, yeah. Richard, literally, on his throat. Oh. Hmm. Oh, wow. And and he did that when he was 14. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Mom and dad. Um, yeah. And I just remember saying to myself, well, okay, were you thinking you might forget your name? Mm-hmm. Were you... <laughs> You were just done with small talk. You wanted to get right to it with strangers. You oh, didn't want to have to say who you were. That was a that was a pretty shocking one. And he's a lovely guy. He's just the salt of the earth. And every now and again, I'd be like, oh, yeah, but you, you have your name tattooed on your throat. That's a weird one. <laughs> well, let's uh, not forget the Nimrod last year as a radio promotion stunt in Philadelphia. You got the Philadelphia Eagles Super Bowl champs, whatever Super Bowl it was last year, uh, tattooed on his arm. 
I don't know what's tattooed there now. Maybe you can just, you know, add another letter or a digit or whatever if they, if they get the job done this year. But uh, you had to know going into that one that there was a pretty good chance you were going to come out looking like an idiot. Or maybe you just Well, gonna... I mean, it, it, at very least, it's a coin toss. Yes, that, that's a bad one, I think. Um, there is uh, I, I'm looking at the KQ Facebook page right now. There are some great photos. Um, I do love the the... The pot leaf on the forehead, and the guy has the words pot head, and that's on his forehead. <laughs> that's that's pretty fantastic. Um, uh, boy, I, I I don't I don't regret not having a tattoo. I I mean seriously, the idea that I would wake up one day and wish I hadn't done that was always that was it was that simple. I never saw I never had an idea that I just needed like that. I've said over the years, if I'm gonna get a tattoo, it will be. And then it's always, you know, it's a washer dryer set, like a stackable or, or a weed eater <laughs> down to my leg or, or, yeah. you know, like a hockey stick down the whole side of my body, like life-sized hockey stick, you know, as a, as a joke. I've just never, I've just never seen anything that I thought I needed to put on there. And part of that is because what if I didn't truly love it? I would just, it would, it, I just couldn't live, I couldn't stand it. But I guess that's, that's kind of the point, you know, you're making a commitment and damn the torpedoes, but I, I, I'm fine with damning the torpedoes. I just don't want them on my skin. I would uh, recommend going to a very reputable tattoo artist. Look at their book, look at their art, and you know, give it a lot of thought. You know, I got all mine when I was drunk. I would not recommend uh, going to a bar in Sioux City, Iowa, leaning across the bar and getting a free one from the bouncer, which I did on my back. I just remembered it. I always forget about it. And it was a scorpion with a nice curled tail and the big claws. How badass is a scorpion tattoo? Except that when you lean on a bar, your uh, your you know your arms are way up over. You know, I was doing that thing where I was leaning up and. And then when I put my arms down, it just looks like a some sort of roach or something, a bug, an insect. It's It didn't turn out well, but it's back there. Every once in a while, I get a comment on it. But uh, I don't go shirtless very often anymore, so there's the upside of that. Pay attention, Wisconsin. There is a new world record as far as consuming beers. How many beers consumed in three hours by some tourists? And they're not from Wisconsin. Sounds like a challenge to me. We'll get into that and some other stuff here at 730. Hang tight. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It's Wednesday, November the 8th. Hey, listen, if you miss any part of this show or the whole thing, hell, I don't know, maybe you had an early day, you didn't have time to get to the radio, you can always catch up with the Morning Show podcast. Uh, anywhere you get podcasts, anytime you want, the KQ Morning Show podcast, sponsored by our friends at Devani's Pizza and Hot Hoagies. We have been discussing some tattoos uh, this morning. A woman on TikTok with many, many, many hundreds of thousands of followers apparently had her boyfriend's name, Kevin, tattooed in large letters right across her forehead. A lot of great comments on the KQ Facebook page. If you have a story you want to share, feel free to talk or text, call or text the KQ Talk and Text Line 651-989-ROCK. If a group of Germans visiting in Spain were looking for a group tattoo, they might consider getting one that says, help us, please. Because a group of Germans vacationing in Mallorca, Spain, have got one, a world record, and two, a bit of a problem. Here's the story. There's a town called Playa de Palma an area known for a very active nightlife. It's often criticized as Spain's capital of, quote, drunken tourism. And a group of 55 Germans, not all together, didn't know each other ahead of time. There's just a whole lot of Germans in the area. They started coordinating a get-together through the WhatsApp, the, the app, messaging app, WhatsApp. They got together started saying, hey, uh, somebody just said out there, I heard some other Germans were here last summer, and they set a beer-drinking mark, a new world record for most beers consumed in three hours. Maybe a bunch of us can get together and beat the record. So 55 German tourists got together, and in three hours, with someone keeping very close look at the time, they consumed 1,000 254 beers. Bravo. 55 people in three hours, 1,254 beers. That's an average of just over 22 beers each. Ooh. 
high five. I mean, they would have missed on the high five after 20-some beers, but I had no idea this WhatsApp. I mean, I knew it was out there. I've never used it, but maybe next time I'm on vacation, y'all have to throw down a beer-drinking contest. I might call in Wisconsinites over Minnesotans, although I don't know if anybody can beat some of my Minnesota buddies. They can throw them back. I, I, well, uh, you know, I have WhatsApp, and, and a lot of Europeans use it. I, I get messages on my WhatsApp like, did you see that game? Or, hey, man, how's the family? Uh, no one has ever said, do you want to get together with a bunch of folks and see if we can't kill ourselves in three hours? 22 beers. Wow. 22 beers in three hours. I, I, may, I Maybe I've done that. I, 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 well, I know I have. I, I drank a case of beer during a Super Bowl once as a dare as a, on a bet. But that was light beer. <laughs> it was, It was. in fact, it was Coors yeah. Light. And it was at a time when I was drinking a lot. And a case of Coors Light over the course of a Super Bowl, including a long halftime show. That's one thing. But 22 beers in Spain with a much higher alcohol content than uh, the silver bullet boy and and for 55 people to all come together and be able to knock it down at that level that's i mean it's impressive and it's horrifying in equal scale to me yeah well, now i know uh, germans are raised on beer in the 80s when i was there there wasn't a drinking age they may have one now uh, but you're literally raised on beer but not i'm sure not every german drank 22 beers which means somebody no. drank like 30 or 35 beers, you know, just to, you know, because, you know, there was somebody that came in and only only was able to manage 10. They might have gotten thrown out of the bar, but had their German visa taken away or, I mean, uh, passport taken away. But, yeah, that's uh, that's impressive, even by good old Midwest beer drinking standards, 22 and three hours. Yeah. You know there's one guy, at least, who when he entered, his friends were like, it's okay, if you can't keep up, Klaus can have 40. He's good. He's yeah. going to take care of the slack. And, uh, <laughs> and and Klaus did just that. The bill, 55 people split the bill. It was about $2,500 for, the, the, uh, for all of these beers. Uh, and by the way, they did beat the record uh, that they were trying to beat. They did it. They, they broke the old record. They smashed the old record, Bob Beeman 68 style. They went over 100 beers past the record <laughs> three hours again three hours 1254 beers for 55 brand new best friends that's fantastic yeah yeah that's impressive that's worth that's worthy of a tattoo that's tattoo worthy i think <laughs> I was one of the 55. You know, that's like that number is probably going to ring out in Bavaria for years. Where Did you hear about the 55? I was one of the 55. Oh, yeah. that'd, that'd, be, that'd be fantastic. Like I was at Woodstock back in the day. Everybody will be saying, oh, I was one of the 55. But, yeah, you get the beer stein and then maybe the number 55 on the top and 1,111, you know, right below that. Yeah, that's that's a good one. That's a winner right there. Um, I, I don't know if any of the, 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 the good people setting this world record um, were aware that there's a new drink they could have followed this up with. There's a product uh, it's going to be launching this year, a little later in the year. It's called Safety Shot. And Safety Shot promises the point of this drink is it reduces blood alcohol content in less than an hour. So basically, when you've had a few too many, get yourself a drink called a safety shot. The formula says it will cut a person's blood alcohol content in half in just 30 minutes, which gives them a general feeling of well-being and reduces the risk of alcohol poisoning and even hangovers. So if you want to follow a big, a big day or night of a bender, uh, with a safety shot, and apparently within 30 minutes it reduces your blood alcohol content. That to me, I don't. That just seems like you're ingesting some sort of weird tapeworm. Like this will just eat all this up. Like you're yeah. you're introducing a, a, an alien form into your body. That's I don't know, man. I, you earned that blood alcohol content level. I don't think setting setting loose the safety shot uh, liquor worm is a good idea. That's just me. Yeah, so, you don't want to. Sounds like it just makes you pee. 
How does, <laughs> what, how does it work? Whatever works. It I, could be I that. wonder what the active ingredient in it is. You don't want to find out that morning where you wake up still drunk and you have to drive to work, which you can't do, shouldn't do. So you take a safety yeah. shot, hoping 30 minutes later your blood alcohol content is going to be in check and you can get your ass to work. You don't want to find out it doesn't work then. But, you know, I'd, I'd screw around with it on the weekend, you know, do it and get up Saturday morning with nowhere to go and see if uh, you got to get yourself a little breathalyzer. You can buy them on Amazon for less than 20 bucks now. But uh, sure. it's something to try. Yeah, I don't know. It, I'm skeptical. It sounds like snake oil. You know, maybe it's maybe it's just that, you know, that orange goop that the guy at high school would throw down on the floor when someone threw up that orange powder. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe Going it's well. just that in liquid form. It just soaks up all the bad stuff. Um, Candace, I believe we have a caller on the KQ Talking Text Line. Yeah, Chris from Maple Grove. Chris, good morning. Good morning, sir. How's it going? Oh, uh, all is well, brother. What have you got for us? Well, uh, my buddy uh, joined the Navy back when we were way young, almost almost twenty years ago, and uh, um, decided like we talked about like having kind of matching tattoos, and uh, he wanted to get his uh, serial number tattooed on himself for some reason. I'm like, hey, that sounds like an interesting plan. You know, I'll go with you. And then so I decided that oh, was an important number to me. So I just, I got my social security number tattooed on myself. So when we got to the um, when we got to the tattoo parlor, my buddy decided last minute that he wasn't going to do it. So I'm the fool that now has his social security number tattooed on himself. Uh, oh, wow! I, I hope it's not like on your forearm. Yeah. Oh no no no! It's 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 on my side, you know, on my legs. So it's like you can never see it. Only person that gets to see it is me and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, it, it, any thought of of changing some of the numbers just to be safe? Like, did you take a uh, maybe take a three and turn it into an eight? I mean, mm. you know the real number, but you know you never know when you're going to find yourself shirtless and wishing people didn't have access to your most personal information. You know, I don't really ever wear a speedo or anything, so I don't really have to worry about anybody else seeing it. I think the only people that maybe see it, you know, like a stranger is, you know, like, let's say I'm getting surgery or I'm dead. But then they'll know who I am because I have my yeah. security number on me. Sounds like it's pretty high Are you high still friends with the – are you and the guy who backed out? Or are you guys still buddies? Oh, yeah, we've been friends for uh, over 30 years. Yeah, we, we hang out quite regularly. <laughs> All right. Well, very good. Well, um, he's st- as far as I see it, the, the, he's still on the clock. He he yeah. still needs to make good on that one. Yeah. Well, he's still active Navy, so he still has time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for the call, brother. That's 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 fantastic. I've never heard. I mean, we were talking about. I mean, I have a friend who's got his name tattooed on his throat, but I've I've never heard of the the SSN tattoo. That's a that's a pretty strong commitment. Yeah, wow. I you know, I ended up with Zep, my name under my tattoo that I don't really remember getting. Uh the story goes that I wanted a picture of a naked lady with mom tattooed across the rear, but uh they just told the tattoo artist. Again, this was a three day pass after basic training, Fort Roberts, Missouri. You know, dumb, young, they let you get tattoos when you're drunk back then. They didn't care. And instead they said just give them the eagle, but for some reason no one can remember why my name's on there. But uh for a while, back in my lawless days. <laughs> I thought, that's not cool. They're going to know exactly who I am by my tattoo. How about Ian? As a friend in the Army, was AWOL and about to leave town, owed him 20 bucks and had a homemade tattoo gun. Would you get a tattoo with a homemade tattoo gun? It was a guitar string that ran down a Bic pen powered by a 9-volt battery. I'm looking at it. It looks like the kind of tattoo you'd get from that, Ian, but thanks for showing it off on the KQ Facebook page this morning. What, who was his roommate, MacGyver? What the hell is right? that? One of those prison tattoos. Uh-huh. My dad got his first one in Germany, also an eagle on his arm when he was in the service. He said back then they just used a razor, and they would just dip ink in it, and they would just cut. He said by you know halfway through the tattoo, the blood was streaming off his elbow. That's old school. That's earning it right there. Sarah, thank you for uh, sending yours in this morning, a tramp stamp that she truly regrets. But Sarah included a photograph. Appreciate that. I don't think it's that bad. It's uh, it's got some class. I think. Man, um, you know, uh, 1992 in Japan, Black Crows were on tour, and our bassist Johnny Colt was already well involved in the tattoo world and tattoo culture. And there was a guy in Japan. I want to say his name was Horiyoshi. Uh, I, I, I'm 
pretty sure. Um, and he was a legend in that world and had been for years. And at that time still, if you were uh, walking around Japan with tattoos that were visible, you were basically announcing to the world that you were part of the Yakuza. Like, that was organized oh. crime stuff. Um, but the promoter... Uh, on the tour, was able to connect Johnny with a uh, a person from Horiyoshi's world. Long story short, he said, I'd like to be tattooed by the man if I could. They set it up. And the way they had to do it was Johnny was picked up at the hotel in a van. The van drove him outside to the city. They got out of the van, put him in a car. The car drove out to a rural area. He was literally blindfolded. <laughs> No. <laughs> so he would not know where he was, not that he would have been able to get anybody back into the city anyway. They ended up in a barn. They removed the blindfold. He met Horiyoshi. He was given a jar of liquor that had a lizard in it and told to take a few sips of it. <laughs> what? <laughs> All this is true. All of this is true. And then Johnny spends a few minutes with the artist, and the, the whole thing was the tattoo artist will tell you what and where. The tattoo will be. Oh, man. Oh, that's, that's ballsy. Risky. I dig it, but I wouldn't do it. And we are all at a big dinner. We're at this steakhouse having, like, the greatest, you know, Kobe beef feast you've ever imagined. And Johnny hasn't been seen for six hours. And he comes walking into this dinner late, and he is just tanked. He's got this really hardcore buzz going. And he opens up his shirt, and on his chest is a severed samurai head. Oh, my oh gosh. that's badass. And it was and it was incredible. And we were all we were completely in awe and kind of freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, what have you done? But that's a story for uh I mean his version of that story is of course phenomenal and takes a good solid hour to get all the nuance. Yeah. But yeah, that was that was that was pretty hardcore. What was that's the expression great. on the face of the severed head? Well, that's the weird thing. It was like um, you know, we, we heard this reference before, but remember in Animal House when they fire the gun and the horse goes, oh, <laughs> sure. no, actually it wasn't that the, the, it, it looked like, no, the, <laughs> the severed head looked like, it looked like a man who accepted his fate with honor. All right. Ah, there you go. That's very Japanese. It's the KQ morning show. 92 KQRS. Zip, Tony, Candace, and Steve Gorman are the KQ morning show. 92 KQRS. It is Wednesday, November the 8th. Good morning, Guns N' Roses, Sweet Child of Mine. The song that, according to bassist Duff McKagan's autobiography, Slash's least favorite Guns N' Roses song what? ever. What the heck? I'm just... Yeah. I, look, I'm not. I'm not going to fight Duff. Okay, he's trained in the martial arts, and uh, that's his words. He says Slash always said it's the worst GNR song ever. Slash also, in his own interview with Rolling Stone a few years ago, said uh, the solo to me I took from equal parts Manfred Mann's "Blinded by the Light" and also some of Jerry Rafferty's "Baker Street" was a, was mm -hmm. an influence on that one. So uh, yeah, you know, might as well if you're going to have an influence influential song or two and they might as well have been huge hits themselves yeah and fans we don't really listen to what the artists think about their songs anyway it's uh, irrelevant it, it truly is i mean honestly and and uh you know most artists will tell you like at some point you realize like i don't really know what's going to capture the public's attention what how do you get your thumb on the zeitgeist you just write songs you throw them all up against the wall and the ones that stick happen to stick uh that song of course lyrically was written axel rose wrote that uh it started from a poem he was writing for his then girlfriend aaron everly whose dad was don everly of the everly brothers uh <laughs> she is now as far as i know living a wonderful life having dodged quite a bullet <laughs> just Hard to argue with that. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, I just don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think that relationship was uh, was was long for the world, and that's probably best for all involved. Uh, speaking of relationships that are long for this world, how long has it been? And I know the and the answer is pretty much most of our lives. How long have we been aware of and enthralled with the music of both Billy Joel and Stevie Nicks? The answer is for as long as they've been making music. They will be making music at the same place on the same night and that is Friday at U.S. Bank Stadium. Billy Joel, Stevie Nicks will be performing 
Uh, and we here at the KQ Morning Show would love to give some tickets away to that very show. Uh, Candace, I believe we have a couple of callers ready to compete in a test of strength and a test of mental agility. Tony, <laughs> please inform us on today's game. This is just a little nice light tidbit. The KQ Morning Show presents... The Hollywood Walk of Fame. Game. The Hollywood Walk of Fame. Game. That's the name of the game. Yep, the Hollywood Walk of Fame game. Uh, there are many stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, including mm-hmm. fictional characters. So we're going to give you a name, and you tell us yes or no. Do they actually have a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame? Fictional characters. I like it. Well, that's lovely. <laughs> I'm ready to play. I'm Thank ready. To, I can't. I can't wait to move Let's forward. I, wow. Fair wow. enough. Well, well. The only thing wow. we're missing, Candace, is contestant number one right now. And who would that be? You got that right, Steve. Our first contestant <laughs> is Chris from Lakeville. Chris, good morning. Good morning. How are you, Steve? Is that Tony, Candace. Mm-hmm. Very oh. good. Thank you. Bright eyed and bushy. Hang too. on. In order, Steve, Zep, Tony, Candace. I'm good. Zep? Oh, good. Yeah, good. Rocking. Okay, Tony? All, Tony? all is well. Okay, now Candace. I'm good. Really okay, good. great. So we're you're four for four <laughs> here, Chris. Uh, we sure. hope you're having a great morning as well. I'm assuming you uh, you like both or at least one of uh, Billy Joel and or Stevie Nicks. Oh, love them both. Love them both. Well, good luck to you. Have a good time. Tony's going to uh, lead the game now. Okay, love fictional characters. Do they have a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame or not? Number one, Kermit the Frog. Kermit the Frog. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to say yes. You are correct. Hey, ho. <laughs> <laughs> Number two is Snoopy. Oh, boy. I'm going to say yes. Mm-hmm. The Snoop yeah. is on there. I love Snoopy so much. So much. Number three, okay, Harry. Re- sorry, Bro- sorry, I got to cut you off, Tony. <laughs> yeah, sorry, really quickly. It's okay. <laughs> who who casts a longer shadow, pop culture wise, Snoopy or or uh, Kermit the Frog? I'd say Snoopy, Snoopy. myself. Snoopy yeah, whoop. I'd go with Snoop. I, I have a Snoopy watch on right now. I don't have a Kermit the Frog watch. Wow, you're badass. <laughs> All right, <laughs> all right, just checking. <laughs> Number three is Harry Potter. Mm, I'm going to say no. Wow, you're doing very well. Three for three, <laughs> baby. Somebody has spent some time on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I watch some of those when they're doing that, when they're doing the stars, but not all of them. So, okay. <laughs> okay, we'll take it. Number four, Iron Man. Iron Man. I mean, his character, Iron Man. Um, I'm going to say no. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. All right, one more to go for your clean sweep. Number five is Woody Woodpecker. Um, God, he's been around for a long time. I'm going to say yes. Good for you, five for five. Wow. Woody Woodpecker. Wow. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Chris coming in strong. I mean, that is outstanding work. Perfect. Thank you. Very proud of you. The other person does. Well, well, you're (laughs) you're reading all my lines here. Chris, hang tight. We're going to put you on hold for a moment. Candace, who's contestant number two? Stephanie from Lester Prairie. Stephanie, good morning. Good morning. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Limber, wide awake. (laughs) You're going to have to bring your A game. Chris went five for five. I wish you the best of luck, Stephanie. Thank you. All right, let's go, Steph. You can do it. <laughs> Number one fictional character, star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, Godzilla. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, but that Lord. Godzilla is on there. <laughs> Damn. Let's wail yeah. through the rest of them because it's fun. <laughs> it's a big footprint. Number two, Jake from State Farm. <laughs> no. That's right. Mm. Number three, Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. No. Correct. Number four is Shrek. No. I'm sorry, Shrek is (sighs) on there, believe it or not. Really? Who the hell's on this committee? I know. Last one is Pee Wee Herman. 
No. I'm sorry the peep is on there. Oh, yes, wow. wow. I'm almost sorry oh. she got one right. You know, if we would have had the five all right and the five all wrong, that would have been a... <laughs> the yin and yang. Show. And Stephanie, I'm on your side. I got most of them wrong in my head already. Mm-hmm. Man, well, um, Stephanie, Stephanie, uh, you know we're not going to let you walk without anything. We do have, as yeah. a runner-up prize, tickets to see the Little River Band Saturday, November 11th at the Medina Entertainment Center. Congrats. Chris, you are the big winner of the day. Might be the big winner of the week. We don't get a whole lot of people going five for five at anything around here. You have tickets to see Billy and Stevie Friday at the U.S. Bank Stadium. Congratulations. I'm sure you will have a great time. You're Thank welcome. You, Steve. <laughs> You're the best. I love music. I, uh, remember my first uh, trip down to Hollywood. Had to go see the stars, right? And down there, and you know, it's not what it used to be. For example, when they put Bob Hope's star there, it was probably a very yeah. nice cafe out in front of a cafe or some uh, swanky salon or something. It's out in front of a tattoo shop now, and there was literally a dude peeing on Bob Hope. <laughs> It was late at night. Oh, and I wandered down there. Yeah, that's the place where I stepped in human excrement in my, and threw the shoes away. You know how you do that in dog poop and the yeah. smell never really leaves the shoe? It was a very nice pair of tennies I had on that day, but in the dumpster they went. Still, I can't believe uh, can't believe they gave one to, uh, who was I? I don't know, Shrek. Really? Shrek got one? Okay. Oh sure, man. Come on. What's 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 the what's the what's the ogre under on him being there? See what I did there. That's very um, clever. <laughs> I would I would hope I, I would I would hope that if you had approached the man urinating on Bob Hope's star, that he would have looked at you and said, "My mom worked for him at his golf tournament, and he was a jerk." Right. <laughs> right. You know, some story where he's like, I've been wanting to piss on this star since I was a little yes. kid. Right, exactly. He left us in squalor. By the way, fun fact about Bob Hope. Real name, Leslie Towns Hope. I don't know why I know this. And also, born in London, England. Oh. Hmm. I know that. Yeah. Some bitch is English. Who knew? God. I mean, is anything... I, I don't know what to believe anymore. I feel betrayed. I'm going to piss yeah, on this star next time I'm in I Hollywood. I don't even... I don't. I don't even know if he was a some bitch. I just want him to be now. I'm just hoping that he left families destitute with false promises and empty guarantees. I just. I don't know. I'm going to turn Bob Hope into a bad guy now before the end of the day. That's fun. Hey, nothing more American than that, right? No, Prop of course not. Maybe there's some Bob Hope memorabilia coming up. This is a perfect this game show lead in for our guest here at eight thirty. Prop Store Entertainment memorabilia live auction. It's one of these where you can do it online. Uh, the most expansive auction of entertainment memorabilia ever, almost underway, oh. happening very soon. Features thousands of authentic costumes and props from all of the big films, along with original guitars, memorabilia from some of the top rock stars in history. Mark Hockman. Will join us at eight thirty to tell us all about it. Hang tight. It's the KQ Morning Show, ninety two KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show for Wednesday, November the eighth. Good morning. I am. Uh, I'm actually doing the show today from Nashville, Tennessee. I flew down here yesterday to see a soccer game, and it sucked. <laughs> Just an awful, awful game. I was so excited. You heard me yesterday on the air. I was all pumped up. I was like, come on, man. This is going to be amazing. And then uh, one thing led to another, and yeah. my team came out and uh, and crapped the bed. But you know what? Life life goes on. You were in it good does. company, right? Didn't you have a good time with uh, Doug, was it? Yeah, yeah, my brother Doug. Yeah, right. Great guy. Love him. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the thing about your brother Doug. You've shared it. You were both miserable. Was There probably wasn't one cheering up the other. It was both... You know, just getting more into the misery of the moment. By the way, this is where Tony hits Crimea River as a Minnesotan, a Minnesota fan of sports for many, many, many years. I mean, now you feel the sting, man. Mm-hmm. That new Barbara Streisand uh, autobiography, 700 pages of Babs. I can't wait. She seems like the kind of person that would crank out 700 pages. I mean, she Babs loves Babs. How many photos she, she, she has her included? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Stack. Yeah, I saw a couple there's, of them. There's, there's, do you know how many different angles you can get of that schnoz? I mean, <laughs> oh my God. God love her. What? I mean, she that she, was she makes trademark. fun of her funny nose. Face. I can. She wow. wouldn't tell you. Yeah, she did an entire movie about it. Funny face, right? Oh. My mom was a big no, fan of funny Barbara's face. <laughs> <Funny, laughs> whatever. Funny, funny face. face. <laughs> funny girl. Funny, funny nose. Face. We know what we're talking about. Oh, my God. I didn't actually uh, watch I, it. 
as a as a as a, as a man with a with a very large <laughs> nose, I, I have no problem talking about other people with large noses. I feel I feel a kinship, if you will, with Babs. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. it's just me. Yeah, I, I don't uh, know. I mean, because she was such an icon of our, the time we were growing up. I mean, I wasn't into Barbara Streisand at all, but my mom was. You know, she loved Barbara Streisand. She was a legit superstar across. I mean, actress, recording artist. What else? I don't know. Magician. Yeah, Big deal. She's a <laughs> hell of a magician. Yes. Yentl, I mean, is still one of the great treasures of modern cinema. You know, in a few minutes, we're going to be speaking. <laughs> Yentl, she was a boy. She oh my wasn't God. a boy. It was just a girl. That's right. Big nose. Not a no, boy. I, big I, nose. Yeah. I remember. Um, we're going to be speaking with a guy from PropStore.com. It's a website. They have a giant, uh, they have a, a, a really large uh, auction that's about to go up. Um, and we are going to be speaking with one of the guys from Prop Store about some of the things they're auctioning off, a guy named uh, Mark Hockman. But, but in the meantime, what they have is stuff from movies. Uh, you know, you can, you can go online and bid for all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, iconic memorabilia from actual films. And I was just thinking, somebody would want that cap from Yentl. I mean, she's wearing that hat in the movie, right? Yeah, Much, I mean, and she did have those knockout eyes to go with it. I mean, it's that was her big feature, right? Those big, big doe eyes of hers. Oh yeah, no. I'm listen. I'm I'm a I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Yeah. I she she's run afoul a couple times. There was the thing when someone posted a photo of her house. Like she has this place on the coast, maybe in Malibu or Santa Barbara, somewhere in California. And there were photos taken, like from a paparazzi helicopter, of her private estate. And she made a huge deal about it, trying to get those pictures taken off the internet. Uh, which, as you might imagine, resulted in those pictures being shared <laughs> billions of times right? around right. the Internet. That was one of those great miscues of like, no, no, no. No, if you don't mention it, no one will care. It'll go yeah. away real soon. <laughs> uh, and she did She did the exact opposite. She made sure everybody on Earth had a birthright to see where she lives. Uh, that was problematic. And then, and then the other thing she did, and this is something she talks about in her book, is that she... When when Siri first became a feature in iPhones, Siri, I believe it was Siri, would mispronounce her name, Streisand. And she got Tim Cook on the phone herself and said, you've got to fix this. <laughs> so seriously, man, I mean, I, I don't know. I just think that's kind of cool. If you can if you can make that happen, you yeah. make it happen. Babs, Good. Babs for life. Uh, all right. We are now joined on the phone on the KQ Morning Show. Mark Hockman is the dir director of consignments for music and posters at Prop Store. You can go to PropStore.com and check this out. The most expansive online entertainment memorabilia auction. This is going up. Uh, it starts November 8th, I'm sorry, 9th to the 12th. So tomorrow you can go to Prop Store and check this out. There's so many things on here, I don't even know where to start. But first things first, Mark, good morning. Thanks for calling in. Good morning, Steve. How are you today? I am, I'm wonderful, sir. Is that West Texas that I hear? Is that what that accent is? <laughs> no, it's, it's West London. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I knew it was I knew it was West something or other maybe Chiswick uh, uh, maybe 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 not um, so okay I'm looking at this uh, at the site right now and just the few things you have listed it's kind of mind boggling to me you are going to be auctioning off Darth Vader's helmet from The Empire Strikes Back whoa yeah one of them yes that was one of the promotional items. Of the original items we have in terms of, of helmets is uh, C-3PO's head, which has been consigned by C-3PO himself, Anthony Daniels, because we're representing his collection. And also mm -hmm. one of the super rare TIE Fighter helmets, which are only on screen for a very, very short time in the movie. That that is astounding, Mark. How much how much do you think C three PO's head is going to fetch? I, I, I there are people that I know personally who would who would go into debt to own a piece of that movie. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll give you the estimate in uh, pounds, and then you, I think the current conversion rate is about one point two to the dollar. But the head mm -hmm. is actually up for. Five hundred thousand pounds to a million. <laughs> Just for a oh moment, God. for a microsecond, I thought he was going to say five hundred pounds, and I was logging on. Oh, Mark! By yeah. the way, is this something you can do online? Make bids online for these items? Yes, you, you can register to bid online. 
You can follow the auction live tomorrow through our platform or the sales rooms platform. And if you're in London, by all means, come along. You can bid live in the room. We're actually at BAFTA, which is in Piccadilly in London. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I were in the neighborhood, I'm not sure you'd let me in the building. But what would be something uh, affordable to an... Do you have anything that would be affordable to an average person, a guitar pick of... Or how about a drumstick of Steve Gorman of the Black Crows? Have you ever heard of him? Huh. Well, I've, I, I wish I had to have done, but I, I've got um, I've got some John Bonham drumsticks in there. Um, they oh. they're absolutely beautiful, and they come with a note from John, which he's wrapped around the guitar sticks, and they uh, they start at two thousand pounds, and we've already had strong bidding on them. Steve, there you I'm go. I'm sure. We're t- we're talking with Mark Hawkman from the uh, from PropStore.com. Their online auction starts off tomorrow, November 9th through the 12th. Thousands of costumes and props from favorite films, along with a lot of music stuff. There's a few on here that I'm I'm really surprised to see from more recent um, uh, iconic moments in pop culture. Uh, Negan's baseball bat from The Walking Dead. I'm assuming that's still wrapped <laughs> in barbed wire and covered in uh, blood. Correct. In barbed wire. I think the blood is fake, thankfully. But uh, <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> it, it's incredible. It, the Walking Dead is just an incredibly popular TV show, but it's also incredibly popular with our buyers. And anything from that really does get snapped up. There's real heavy competitive bidding over something like that. Now, Mark, do, do you have a personal collection? Do you do you do you collect these things? And are you as as as, as interested in this as the people that are getting on uh, the site to go log in and and make bids? My my personal thing is posters, but I do. Um, there are a couple of things on here which I really do like and would like to own, just from from my history, from when I was growing up. I mean, one of the things on here is that we've got in the auction is David Bowie's first ever single. And it was a single called Liza Jane that he released in 1964. But the record Mm. label is actually stamped Tom Jones because very, very (laughs) few people know this, but David Bowie's original stage name was Tom Jones. And it was a case of he was signed to the record label Decca at the time, and so was, as you know, the Las Vegas entertainer Tom Jones was also signed to them at the same time. And Decca decided to go with uh, the Las Vegas Tom Jones, so Bowie had to change his name. Um, And we believe that this single is the only time it's ever been printed officially where he was called Tom Jones. I, I, yeah, that's all new information to me. I knew he was David David Jones originally, is what I thought, but yeah. I never knew he performed as yeah. as Tom Jones. Uh, I I, no, I, I think I I think Decca Records made the right choice only because I like the name David Bowie so much. I'm glad he had to come up with it. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a bit unlucky with his early names, but uh, yeah, I agree with you. David Bowie is a brilliant. <laughs> and as I say, I, I would that's a at five to ten thousand pounds. Again, we've had really, really strong interest with it. The Bowie fan base is incredible, but that is a piece I would really like, just because of the. I, I love David Bowie as a performer, and I, it, it's just such a fantastic piece with an incredible history. Yeah, no doubt. Prop Store Entertainment Memorabilia a Live Auction gets started tomorrow. Uh, Mark, I'm going to ask you what the website is. And I'm curious about these, uh, how you participate. If it's a live auction, and I'm here in Minnesota, I won't be. But we have listeners that make a lot of money. Maybe they'd, I mean, how do you bid online? I've not done something like this. Bid online for while well, there are people live in the room bidding. How does that work? Well, you, if, it's basically now there's live people in the room and we also have a, an internet connection. Yeah. So people can actually follow the auction through our, our, our own platform, which is propstoreauction.com, or you can log on at propstore.com and you can watch the auction live through our website. And if you've registered to bid before, you will have the option 
that you can bid. You can, not just can you follow the auction, but you can bid live on the auction yourself. So it's almost as if you were there bidding against somebody in the room. Yeah, you have personal guitar is belonging to Angus Young, Johnny Marr. We just had him on talking about his uh, new book, his illustrated book about his guitars. You yeah. have a Johnny Marr guitar, Paul Stanley, Noel Gallagher. Uh, these are guitars that they actually played was part of their, their life that they're auctioning now? Yeah. Yes. The Angus Young one, he used it in his uh, the promotional video that he did for VH1. Um, and... Mm. Angus Young memorabilia is incredibly rare, so this was a great piece to get in. Really, really great piece. There's a huge army of ACDC fans out there. Yeah. Absolutely huge. Of course. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised you say that. When I saw his name listed, it just dawned on me. I pay peripheral attention to things like this. I've never heard of one of his guitars anywhere in a private collection. So, yeah, that's a that's no, a heck of a get right there. Yeah, I mean, as I say, it was used for the VH1 promotional video for uh, Stiff Upper Lip. And it, it's one of, mm. uh, well, we think it is one of the very, very few guitars that Angus has played that has ever come onto the market. And, and it's a great looking guitar as well. And there's a full 25 minute video with it that you can see him playing it for the promotion. That's you know incredible. What? Mark, can I, I ask you, what's the what's the highest, uh, what item do you have that has the highest estimated uh, winning bid? Um, for the memorabilia, it is C-3PO's head at 500000 mm -hmm. wow. And then for the music, we have Michael Jackson's jacket from the Pepsi commercial, and that's at 200000 <laughs> $200,000, $400,000. Oh, oh, Whew! I don't know. I think he's probably got to go out and just get all those boxing shorts from Raging Bull, worn by Robert De Niro, obviously. Is that something yeah. you, you throw through the wash, or has that still got the Robert De Niro stank on it? <laughs> uh, in, in one way, I hope they have been washed, but in another way, I hope they haven't. <laughs> so, more valuable. Yeah, Robert right, De Niro <laughs> aroma. It's fantastic. Uh, Mark, tell us again, where can people go online? What what sites should they go visit if they want to uh, sign up and make bids? They can use two. They can go to propstoreauction.com or they can go to propstore.com. Both of those have got real, real clear indicators to, to the auction, and it's a step-by-step -step process of how to bid and how to register. If, if you just want to go to the platforms and watch the auction, that's absolutely fine. You can do that, and it, it's just like watching a TV show. And, and it, it's, it is very, very addictive watching it. I'm... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is. Uh, that sounds that way to me. Mark, thanks for taking the time to call in. All the best with the auction, no, which I, sounds you, kind sir. of a silly thing to say. I think you guys are going to do great. <laughs> yeah, I know. Man, I, I tell you what, that that, that is like, I, it, what he just said is interesting. It's addictive. I don't doubt that it is. And I've I've taken place in one auction in my life, and it was at a preschool fundraiser, and the, the heat got in my skin, and I ended up bidding on some crap my kids made and paid way too much for it <laughs> because it turns into a competition. Yeah. Suddenly, I'm like, you're not going to outbid me, lady with the Pinot Noir, and I'm just having an argument across the <laughs> bidding table because I'm no way is anyone leaving with that toy trunk that I don't need. Yeah, right. I mean, it's it's a frenzy. It gets into it. I, I remember when eBay first started, way back during the PlayStation 2 days, I thought, I'm going to get on. You couldn't find them right away in the stores, you know, because they're all sold out. But the, people were reselling them on eBay. And I would go on and watch people bid far over what you could go down to Best Buy and buy this thing for just because they got into a bidding <laughs> frenzy. I'm like, stop. You're just paying way <laughs> sure. over the value. This isn't a collector's item. Uh, but once you get that bidding going, man, you start frothing at the mouth people can't stop what well, i know a lot of people that think about look forward to retiring so i just had some conversations about that when i got to the with the family together uh over the weekend me i fantasize more about those years way past retirement i say fantasize i'll never get there but you know where you're so old you can literally do anything and get away with it and mm -hmm. that's why you got to mm -hmm. keep an eye on the oldsters. We're going to tell you what one Gramps got into here at 9 o'clock. Hang tight. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. Zip. Tony.
Candace and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It's Wednesday, November the 8th. Good morning. ACDC with You Shook Me All Night Long. A song that still sounds well, pretty good after 43 years. I, I think ACDC was on to something when they put that record together. Call <laughs> me crazy. Uh, 43 years have passed since that record was released, Back in Black, the biggest selling rock album of all time. Um, I, I remember very clearly that record being in stores. I remember everyone talking about it. And if you yeah. had told me then, yeah, you know, it's still going to matter 43 years from now, I would have said, there's no way I'll still be around in 43 years. That would make me almost 60. And that's too <laughs> old for anyone to still be alive. Go figure. Um, and, uh, and, and we're talking about some oldsters. Uh, Zepp, you mentioned this before uh, the break. Uh, we do have to say goodbye to a, a, an elderly gentleman from New York City, a 91-year-old fellow named Bobby, who went viral a couple years ago. Bobby, you may remember this story. In 2019, he was a big fan of yogurt. In fact, the guy uh, generally ate uh, several tubs of yogurt a day, kind of lived <laughs> on the stuff. Right. And he went viral after a photo was posted of him. with um, It looked like he had gotten into some sort of a minty-flavored yogurt yogurt he thought it was a uh maybe he thought it was like a peppermint chocolate type of yogurt it was mint green paint (laughs) this this yogurt loving (laughs) grandpa bobby in 2019 literally he used to go through a a large tub you know when you go to the store you get that one is it's it's big Bigger than a pint. It's not a quart. Whatever the larger mm-hmm. tub of yogurt you can buy, he would eat a full one every single day of his life. He got into one in 2019 that, as I said, was mint green colored paint. And he was about halfway through the tub before he realized something was amiss. Um, and now, of course, his daughter shared the photo and said, oh, my dad got into this. He thought it was yogurt. And clearly at the time, had he experienced a lot of difficulty, she probably wouldn't have posted that video. Yeah. Uh, but but my man, literally, it just went right through him. He said, no, nah, really, it, I had an upset <laughs> stomach for a little while. But that was about it. It was about half a quart uh, thinking it was yogurt before it dawned on him. It was really bad uh, that, that it was that it would tasted really bad. Then it turned out it was, in fact, paint. And then the story came out. No, his stomach was unfazed. He was perfectly fine. All this to say, in case you do remember that story, because I remember what had happened, Bobby has now passed away. Uh, uh, no word on whether or not he had he, he had swallowed some Drano or perhaps gotten into, <laughs> you know, I, I, no, no telling what happened. But seriously, Bob, we hardly knew ye, but a real, a real stickler. And it just goes to show, when you get to a certain age, y- you got to work really hard to kill yourself. You know, his immune system had been through so much, a bunch of paint was just like a back rub (laughs) yeah you know i think about obviously the joints go and the hearing goes and the eyesight goes but i forget it comes up every once in a while your taste buds as we get older you start to lose uh, your ability to taste as well as you did obviously when you were younger Uh, your sense of smell it all starts to go i guess every damn thing but the fact that he got through so much damn paint before he realized first of all hats off to uh, the paint industry for getting the lead out of their paint and making something safe enough uh, for <laughs> yeah. a nearly 90 year old man at the time to be able to ingest a lot of it and not kill him but uh, not recommending that for anyone however paint eating grandpa it says here in the story i'm looking at finally passed away peacefully in his sleep they even had he has even had an action figure for a while yogurt grandpa a little action mm-hmm. figure and him holding a paint can and yeah his uh, mint green lipstick I, I can't, like I, you know, I'm trying to think if I've ever eaten and if I've ever been, you know, halfway through a meal or even more than one bite into something that was rotten or spoiled or terrible before I, before I recognized that was the case. And I, I, I and the only, t- I, I ate some bad sloppy joes once, but they didn't taste bad, but they made me sick as a dog an hour later. Oh, yeah. um, but, but at the time, but then again, I was drunk. So maybe it did taste terrible and I just didn't notice. I reheated some sloppy joe meat that had been uh, mm-hmm. sitting in the, pan i thought for a couple hours but it had actually been like 24 hours i was like let's just reheat that Um, big mistake big big mistake was it a mistake though because you just got you got a nice clearing out you know you gotta think on the bright side you're, I know you're a fan of clearing out the pipes whenever possible in, in you know, two lines, no waiting. That's how you like it. Front and back uh, egress. Um, 
I gave uh, we we traveled when the kids were young. We we lived in Los Angeles and we flew to Atlanta, uh, gonna see some friends, go see some family, drive around the South, and uh, you know. So let's see. This is in the summer of '03, so our daughter is a year, about 15, 16 months old, and we had a long travel day. We get to our buddy's house, and I run out to the store to grab some supplies, and I bought some milk. And it was the brand that she loved to drink. And I raced home to my buddy's house where we were staying. And I opened that milk and I put it in her bottle. And at no point did it turn did it occur to me to smell the milk. Because who in the world would have curdled milk on the shelf of their all oh. health food store? And I I didn't I, I mean, I filled a bottle, handed it to her, and she just started drinking like this is great, thank you. And then within a few minutes, it's everywhere. And the smell it's one thing that the bad milk smells bad. Bad milk, once it's been in a toddler's uh, digestive system and then returned <laughs> to you, smells oh. even worse. And it was just a fountain, a geyser. And it was like, there's no way you drank that much milk. Where's this extra milk coming from? But, uh, yeah, that that was another one of those lessons. I was like, I, and to this day, I, if, I don't drink milk myself, but if I'm putting some in coffee, if I'm going to put cream, I, I literally smell it. I look to make sure if I add cream to coffee, I don't do that very often. Sometimes I feel, I feel like I'm on vacation. I'll have a little cream and sugar today. Why not live a little? If I do that, I always look to make sure there's not a little floaty bits of cream that have curdled. <laughs> it, 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 it made me pretty freaked out. And as That's a good. lifelong... It is good. And that's what, you're right, Candace. There, see, there's a silver lining. When you poison your child, yeah, you never forget. You learn a lesson. <laughs> yeah, right. It stays with you. I remember my cousin Shane was, I don't know, maybe five. I would have been at that time six or seven. So I'm not exactly sure of his age, but ate a lot of grapes in the family. Gave the kids the grapes, right? Uh, love grapes. And, of course, uh, he's over at our place, and my mom has the fake fruit sitting right there on the table with the fake apple and the fake grapes, the rubbery grapes. And I think he got about six or seven of those in him before mom caught him. And I guess they probably passed okay, but yeah, he ate a bunch of plastic grapes. Didn't realize they were... Yeah, I mean, you don't notice that's different than the grape, the juicy, flavorful, wonderful grapes you've been eating, the plastic mm -hmm. thing that you literally can't chew? All right. That was Shane. He's, you know, yeah. Not the brightest bulb I in did. the Zep chandelier. I did. I did eat one time. Um, what's the What's the di What's the thing? What uh, Mexican food? But it comes like wrapped in a corn husk. I'm spacing yeah, on the tamale. word for that. Thank you. The Christmas uh, the tamale. First time, the first time someone ever handed me a tamale, I just took. A, I just picked it up and ate it like it was a little mini burrito. And they were like, oh. "No, you don't eat the corn husk <laughs> thing. You open that and scoop out the innards." And I was like, "Yeah, that makes sense now. That that that's better. That's a better that's plan." I did that with edamame the first time I had it too. <laughs> I eat the whole thing. Yeah, sure. My brother ate the shrimp tails and all there for oh. a while. He only noticed when he asked me why I wasn't finishing my shrimp. But to be fair, it was the first time we had shrimp. As teenagers, I was leaving for the for basic training, and Dad took us in for the shrimp meal before he got one off the family teat. And uh, but Chris, yeah, he got all of his shrimp. You don't want to you don't want to leave anything on that plate, man. You don't know when that shrimp shrimp boat's coming back through. You want to <laughs> no. you want to get it all right, right. Um, hey, check this out. A here's a story out of the state of Maine. Where has anyone spent much time in Maine? I, I have, and I've always left there thinking, <laughs> oh, it's like it's like Mississippi or rural Louisiana, but with just a different accent. But yeah, that's yeah. just like these these are people who you you just you, I can't understand a word they say, and I'm just nervous when I'm there. Yeah, my mom born in Maine, but there's two types of, there's the coastal Maine where she was born, Biddeford, right there on the coast. Those are the lobster fishermen, and they can be a bit redneck okay. too, but my aunt, uh, she was inland Maine. Uh, Maine is mostly wilderness, so you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Just hicks yeah. and goofballs out there and, you know, and people that keep to themselves, and uh, th that's mostly Maine, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, granted, deliverance, uh, it just works with southern accents. I get that. Um, <laughs> you know, but uh, like a guy said, no, come on, I want you to squeal like a pig. I mean, that doesn't really, <laughs> you know, stir the fear in, in, in the average oh. moviegoer uh, oh. quite like a southern accent. But that's what I feel like <laughs> when I'm out there. And I so I love stories about Maine, uh, uh, even more so than New Hampshire. Just something about Maine to me where it just it's almost like Florida man, northern version. Uh, a guy in Maine was arrested. He he hopped, He called an Uber. Perfectly legal thing to do. Asked the Uber driver to take him to TJ Maxx, 
And the guy said, sure thing. And as they're driving, uh, my, my man in question, he's a 41-year-old dude named Kevin Gray, he mentioned to the driver more than once, oh, by the way, I'm going to this TJ Maxx. I'm going to knock it off. I'm robbing the TJ Maxx. He just says, I'm going to steal some stuff. I got some stuff I need to get, and then I'll probably <laughs> knock over a cash register. Literally just tells this guy his whole plan. And then, oddly enough, the driver drops him off and immediately calls the police. <laughs> they, the, sh- the cops show up, and the guy is like in mid-robbery that he had been telling his Uber driver was about to go down. And, of course, they arrested him. This is his 12th arrest of the year, which tells me it's his 12th cry for help on a certain yeah. level. But I, I just, I really, really like the idea of, of you just feeling like, I don't know, I feel like this Uber driver gets me. I think, I think he'll be <laughs> cool with this. this just going to run this up the flagpole and yeah. see what happens. He's just super lonely, it sounds like. He wants to keep getting arrested. They, the problem is they keep letting him out, and then he goes back to his probably sh- self-made shack out in the middle of the woods and starts missing people again. He doesn't have the social skills. Uh, this worked before. He got to meet people, went into the cop shop. They fingerprinted him, got to talk to the other inmates. Yeah, all right. Maybe just got to keep him around for a little bit, you know, before he maybe, has to do something maybe instead keep him of- in for a long time. Instead of having to talk to every Uber driver, may, maybe he could tattoo on his forehead, I plan to rob the next business I enter. <laughs> and just that way, it's just always out there. No one has to question the man's intentions. He's, yeah. he, it just, it, you know, you kill a few birds with one stone. We, we did talk earlier in the show about a woman who tattooed her boyfriend's name on her forehead in large yeah. letters. Kevin, right across her forehead. She's already a, this is not a one-off. This is a woman who's already received many, many tattoos, including uh, what I call the full throat uh, tattoos. Uh, but but still, to go with the forehead, Kevin, like we said, there's not, you know, bangs aren't going to do it. You can't, any. Uh, there's no way to cover this up other than with, like, literally covering it up with, like, grease paint. Um, uh, and it's just such a commitment that I'm, as a man who's never uh, made, made the tattoo commitment, it's just kind of mind-boggling to me. Candace, you are famously uh, living your life with a Jim Morrison tattoo on your on your uh, physique. <laughs> is 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 are there other tattoos that I don't know about, or is that it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <Okay. laughs> that's that. No, yeah, I have um some Aussie lyrics. Um, okay. And then I have a son. And then, oh, so the we don't congratulations! Now. <laughs> I never, we never knew that. Hey, don't this put is that wonderful. in the universe, boys. Don't put that in the universe. All right. Um, no, the sun is lo- like Jim is looking at the sun, famously okay. because they have a song called "Waiting for the Sun." Um, right. Sure. Yeah, and I just the I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to give Jim something to look at instead of just like all the weird guys that I hook up with all the time. So I just decided to put. <laughs> Um, a sun up there. <laughs> Could you get some weird sunglasses guy? tattooed? Yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. Like he is wearing guys. sunglasses. Right. Yeah. We have a lady on our he- Facebook page, and I don't know, I don't, ha- I don't have it in front of me right now, but uh, she got a tramp stamp of her name, so the guys wouldn't forget her name. That was a pretty bold move. Don't I like you that. have a tattoo wow. of your name on you, Zep? Yeah, but I can see it. Oh. You know, it's not, it's not there to remind people of who I am while they're, you know. <laughs> Ram Jim approaching from you from behind. behind. Right. Wow. Uh, here's one from my buddy Matt. We had a kid in high school, a complete uh, dumbass, who tattooed Satan rules on the back of his hand. He did it himself. It says Satin rules. <laughs> Sat- uh, <laughs> well, it, the feel of satin. Who can argue it- with that? I mean, yeah, it, it's it's uh, th- there are worse things you could say that rule. I guess. Um, Yes, spelling spelling is a real big big part about. Uh, I would just think that's job one of a tattoo artist is confirm the spelling. Uh, you've probably got to do that. You've probably I, I'm sure many a tattoo artist has had to protect his prospective client by saying no, no, that's not how that's spelled. Imagine how drunk the drunken arguments that happen in late night tattoo parlors where someone's saying, "I know how to spell eclipse, man. It's got two X's." Like it's just yeah, the, it's a, it's part of the responsibility. If you're going to be a proper tattoo artist, have a dictionary on hand. Oh yeah, the, the guy that did my Jim Morrison tattoo was this hot Russian, um, and luckily no spelling was involved. 
but he was just a really um, beautiful man. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I just laid down on my dining room table and you just went at it. <laughs> it was a dining room table. So this was a, this was a, it was like a, an Uber, a tattoo eat, Uber eats guy showed up and tattooed you in your no, home. It was when I was living in Italy and everything is done in the dining room in Italy. Everything, everything. Uh huh. Crapping. And, um, except that. How long? How long did it take, start to finish, soup oh God, to nuts? Hours, when he started, hours. Uh-huh. You know, we take breaks. You know, have a little vino, yeah. a little smoke, whatever, whatever. A little, you know. Was there was there any uh, pasta ingested during oh, yeah, the tattoo the, process? Oh, <laughs> did you? <laughs> yeah, he was just visiting us, so we all got tattoos um, together as a little familia. Made some craft mm. mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> sure, so no, both I do not regret fast it. To make. I do not regret it. Man. Um, I have a dear friend in Los Angeles. He's a kid from Boston, actually. Um, uh, performs under the name Blue, B-L-E-U. He's made several great power pop albums. And Blue has a large tattoo on his left, uh, on his on his arm, on his bicep. And, and it's just in harsh black block letters, the word tattoo. Oh. <laughs> it's just, oh, just it, fantastic. Yeah, that is that is fantastic. I'm looking at one here. I assume this is supposed to be some sort of flower. Oh, and I just left this stupid Facebook page. Oh, yeah, from Sydney. Uh, but a lady's flower it resembles a lady's flower more than a flower. I see what they were trying to do there. Maybe a mm-hmm. carnation or something. But, yeah, looks more like the lady's personal flower, if you know what I mean. Ooh, yeah, that's a tough one. That's on the arm, too. On the arm? Wow. Yeah. Well, the talking you know. text line, uh, somebody says their buddy got a, a Darth Vader helmet with flames right on his chest about the size of a dinner plate. <laughs> and it says, it says, what a numb skull. <laughs> oh, well, you know, go big or go home, right. man. Why not? Man, that is the truth right there. Oh, right. wow. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. Benny and the Jets from Elton John. A song, uh, of course, lyrics uh, by Bernie Taupin. Bernie Taupin wrote that song and said he saw Benny as a female character, a sci-fi rock goddess. And he said it was almost Orwellian. It was supposed to be a futuristic thing. Benny and the Jets were a prototypical female rock and roll band from science fiction, almost like automatons. Now, what's not said out loud but is clearly in the subtext of that is that he was stoned as a <laughs> baseball bat when he wrote those lyrics yeah. just bernie Taupin, just on the chiba just going like i don't know i see like a robot themed chick band yeah. um and then he went on to say that when he first saw robert palmer's addicted to love video the first time he saw that he screamed that's benny and the jets right there <laughs> like those wow. women just <laughs> like expressionless like automaton robotic women in a rock band elton john for for his part was blown away when the record company suggested releasing that song as a single. He thought they were insane and and that they should release Candle in the Wind in the United States. That was a big hit in England. And the label said, no, we're going to go with Benny and the Jets. And Elton fought them tooth and nail. And then, of course, it went to number one. And interestingly <laughs> enough, interestingly enough... It was the first. Uh, it, it it started its its rise to the top of the charts on black radio. Black radio stations played that song, and in fact, Elton performed on Soul Train, the first white megastar to ever appear on Soul Train. He followed Dennis Coffey and Gino Vanelli, who had already appeared on there, but he was the first big star to be on Soul Train playing Benny and the Jets. And as Elton John has said many times since, it just goes to show I never know anything. And we said earlier, Slash always said his least favorite Guns N' Roses song is Sweet Child of Mine. Uh, Trust the art, never the artist, because the artist half the time doesn't know any idea you know they don't even know why they're doing what they're doing half the time they're just expressing and it comes out sometimes it works out and uh, when you're elton john and bernie talpin it sometimes happens all the time yeah right well they're too close to it right i mean the the record producers are they're looking at the the, the hits in america and they're like people are just going to want to go benny benny and he's thinking candle in the wind yeah. it's got these uh, poetic lyrical this beautiful music piece and this is him just going didn't didn't benny 
But yeah, hey man, that's uh, that's your audience right there. He did say uh, I ran across an interview with him on a Chicago radio station from 1974. Maybe it was a couple of years before that when he was just uh, he was already a big thing and only getting bigger. And he talked about they talked about well your career's pretty young. What do you consider to be a highlight so far and he mentioned Motown. He said I grew up on Motown records and to come over mm-hmm. here and be honored by Motown and to play at places like the Apollo and you know be recognized on black radio stations. He said by far he goes that just blew him away and, and then was humble about it saying not worthy that sort of thing. Sure. I saw something the other day. Um, the Motown studio, you can take a tour of the old Motown studios, the house, the series, the, it's, a, it's a few houses in Detroit, and it's available for tours now. Uh, the piano that was used on all of those great tracks, um, all of, all the stuff Barry Gordy produced and Smokey produced, and, you know, the entire Motown vibe of the 60s into the 70s, there was just a house piano, and it had fallen into disrepair, and Paul McCartney came through the tour uh, not that long ago, within the last 20 years, and he just paid he just said what you know find out what it costs to refurbish this piano and of course he quietly went ahead and paid for it and when that story was announced when someone finally said oh by the way that piano is back in perfect shape because mccartney underwrote that process and it was a few thousand bucks i guess maybe 10 or 20 grand uh he was immediately attacked for being greedy and oh yeah well why didn't you buy the whole museum and oh, and oh you think that's a big deal and it's like you know you do a good deed and then someone says well you should have done more uh you know classic stuff but the beatles like elton john when they came over and and met motown artists those were you know they were blown away and if you think about it growing up in a town like liverpool or like elton john if you're in a west london suburb um it talk, you know you know it's one thing for elvis presley feels like he's from another planet but then you're listening to 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 motown records and stacks records and soul music um, even though Motown's Detroit, it's all basically the American South on your record player, uh, culturally speaking. That must have felt like something from another planet. And for those artists to come over here and find that kinship, of course, speaks to the, you know, that that's what music is here for. Uh, those English kids understood the blues a lot better than most American kids. And it's always... It's always just amazing to, to see the reactions from one group to the other. And, and, and for Elton John to say that, not a surprise at all. Like he doesn't sound like a, he doesn't sound like a soul singer, but growing up, I mean, he, he, if anybody understood the blues, it was Elton John as a young man in post-war Britain. But, you know, sincerely, like that's yeah. a guy who is not is probably struggling to find himself and, and find a, a peace of mind. And uh, that's usually where the great artists come from. Uh, kind of like Bruce Dickinson, the singer of Iron Maiden. <laughs> How's that <laughs> for a segue? <laughs> Um, no, this is this has nothing to do with the blues. It has nothing to do with, with Motown or Stax or anything, but it's hilarious. Bruce Dickinson is now starring in a horror film. It's oh, called... Sure. It's a movie called not Born of the Dead, but Bjorn of the Dead, <laughs> and it's it's a horror movie that features uh well it's it, it it's about an ABBA tribute band, oh. a group of tribute bands. In fact, they get trapped in a nightclub at the start of a zombie apocalypse. Oh my God, I'm gonna watch this. So, yeah, me too. It sounds awesome. Are, are you kidding? A story about a bunch of tribute bands all having to, you know, and hopefully it turns into Lord of the Flies really quickly. And if that's the case, you know, the ABBA tribute band is like, we have way more hooks oh. than you and your Rolling Stones tribute <laughs> band will have the last pork chop. And then it just turns into just, you know, all out warfare for the final scraps of food. That'll be fantastic. Bruce Dickinson's son, Austin, co wrote the film. <laughs> and it says there are a lot of other cameos from the world of rock and heavy metal. Production begins early next year. Bjorn of the Dead. Oh. I can't wait to hear Mike Evans review that one next year. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. That's on a, a short list of movies that will get me off my butt and into the theater. Although that one, well, we'll see if it gets to the theater. That might just be a, a direct to streaming. We'll see. A, I don't know what kind of budget it has or something like that. I mean, Bruce is probably pumping some money into the kids' uh, movie. Should do well. But I- yeah, you, you had me at Bjorn of the Dead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I if if it was if it was a story about Bjorn Borg becoming a zombie, I'd watch that. Yep. So this is even better somehow. Yeah, yeah. why not? I I, t- I talked to a buddy in Nashville a couple of years ago, and he was actually it's funny he was working on a screenplay about 
um, a bunch of tribute acts on a cruise ship and something went down. I don't remember exactly, but it was a similar thing. I don't think it was a zombie apocalypse, but it was life on a cruise ship with tribute acts and they get stuck or they, they're all stuck there for a length of time. Uh, I guess the tribute band, you know, die hard, like, like they said, speed was die hard, but on a boat, you know, there was a series of movies about situations that die hard. They just said, well, do die hard, but put it on a plane and put it in a boat and put it in an elevator or whatever. I, I guess there's something to be said about the cruise ship and the tribute band. Uh, people thinking alike there. I like oh, yeah. It. It's time has come, too. I mean, I know a few people that have been out. One has been out on a Kiss tribute. Um, I'm forgetting. I think Def Lepp was out on one. Uh, then another couple friends of mine up there in Rogers uh, that they went to as well. So the time has come to start, you know, lampooning that a little bit. But those are those are big business. A lot of uh, very... Uh, noteworthy bands go out on those uh, tribute cruises. Oh, the, it's huge. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, And, and um, my band Trigger Hippie was offered a few over the years, and, and the answer was always, oh, God, no. Absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> Hell no. Yeah. I'm not getting on a... I'm not getting on a cruise ship with, with 5,000 drunk rock fans. That's just not, that's just not going to happen. I... <laughs> As I've always said, I will take my Legionnaire's disease on dry land. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Last place. Remember those pandemic boats that were out there for six, seven Oof. months? No, thank you. Uh-uh. How about a history lesson? Sports history on this day in 1970, Tom Dempsey kicked a 63-yard field goal. That was an NFL record. Tom Dempsey did that with half a foot. He was very famously born without toes on, on his right foot, and he would kick the ball from what looked like just a, you know, it was a stump, but his shoe was a special shoe they'd built for him, and it was just a big flat face. And, of course, people thought, well, that's that's why he's such a good kicker. But I didn't see anybody rushing out to cut half their foot off to try to match him. Uh, that record stood in 1970 until 1990. 98 when it was tied by Jason Elam and and it was a sad day because my whole life had been spent thinking about that crazy guy with the weird looking foot breaking that record and it made me feel good and now forget it Justin Tucker has the record 66 yards is the longest field goal he set that two years ago September of 21 but how about this in 2008 Sebastian Janikowski of the Raiders attempted and missed very, very closely. Very, almost made it. He attempted a 76 yarder. <laughs> yeah. Mind boggling. I think, wasn't it outdoors too? I think it yeah. might have been oh, a yeah. home game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that was, that, you got a, props for the effort right there. The KQ Morning Show, 92 KQRS.